Hello, I'm Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service here in Hancock County. Uh, always a pleasure to be joining you uh, through another one of these online presentations. Uh, if you're joining me here live, really appreciate you being here. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, always a pleasure to have you doing that as well. And I encourage you, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, two things, if you have any questions, you can put those in the comment section of the YouTube channel. Uh, and I will see a notice that you have asked that question and I'll get back to you just as soon as I possibly can uh, with an answer to that question. Uh, and of course, if you are uh, here live, we'd love to have your questions as well. If you're watching on YouTube, also encourage you uh, hit the subscribe button. That'll let you know when I'm putting up new videos. Uh, we're trying to keep this going on you know, several videos or, or several presentations per week. Uh, and I'm gonna have some uh, really good guest speakers here in the very near future. Uh, but today we're gonna be talking about azaleas for the home landscape, rightly one of the favorite landscape plants uh, for all over the Southeastern United States. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the diversity of azaleas, uh, how to plant them, uh, how to make sure we're maintaining them well in the home landscape, uh, and some of the problems that you might see and uh, ways that we can address that to, uh, to keep these plants just uh, being fantastic and beautiful, uh, particularly as we're getting into the spring. Uh, so I always like to start off with uh, just a little bit of basic information about what azaleas are. Uh, azaleas are a member of the family Ericaceae, uh, which uh, includes some other popular plants that we have in the home landscape, of course, including the blueberry, uh, and all of these azaleas are in the genus Rhododendron. Uh, so, of course, you're, you're probably familiar with rhododendrons uh, as another group of great landscape plants. Uh, so, when we talk about azaleas versus talking about rhododendrons, when, we're when we use the word rhododendron, we generally use that to talk about plants that tend to have large, kind of lever leathery, evergreen, evergreen leaves. Whereas, when we're talking about azaleas, uh, we use that for plants that tend to have smaller and thinner leaves. And so that's just a distinction we use to talk about the plants and as we're using them in the landscape, while they both really are in that genus rhododendron. Now, there are an awful lot of species, uh, about 800 all over the world, uh, and many, many hundreds of cultivars that have been developed. So there really is uh, a great diversity of these plants. Uh, and a lot that they can do in the landscape. Uh, so different groups, you know, there are different ways that we can categorize all of these plants. Uh, and so I'm gonna go through a couple of ways we can talk about it. Uh, so we have evergreen and deciduous azalea. So evergreen, of course, tend to maintain their leaves throughout the year. Uh, and here in the United States, those tend to be imports or uh, non-native uh, groups of plants that are generally native uh, to Southeast Asia, including Japan, China, Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, so all of those tend to be coming from, again, Southeast Asia, uh, whereas deciduous azaleas lose their leaves in the autumn. Uh, some of those are native to here in North America. There are some great native azalea species that we have here, uh, but some are also native to Eastern Europe, as well as, again, to Southeast Asia. Uh, there is, in addition to that, a quite a lot of differences in the flowers that we see. Uh, now, the deciduous azalea tends to have tubular flowers. Uh, you can see kind of a picture of that there, and I'll show some better images of that as we're going. Uh, and they tend to have uh, really long stamens, uh, and you can see a diagram of a flower there just to kind of give you a, uh, uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, and those tend to extend out beyond the petal. Uh, we see a lot more diversity in flower shapes uh, for the evergreen azaleas. Uh, the most common is going to be the single flower form. Uh, you can use that diagram there for reference. Uh, and it tends to have five or more petals. Uh, and then you have the stamens and the single pistil just coming right out the center of that flower. Uh, then you have semi-double, where some of those stamens have been turned into uh, or transformed into petals. Uh, double flowers, where all the stamens have been transport, uh, transformed into petals. 
uh, hose and hose varieties. Uh, those have the, the petals, but they also have colored sepals uh, that add into the beauty of the flower. Uh, then you have semi double hose and hose and double hose and hose. Uh, and so, you know, the real lesson that I take away from that uh, is there are a lot of different flower forms and a real diversity in flowers, particularly in the evergreen azaleas. Uh, and so you have a lot to pick from and you can have a lot of diversity in your landscape as you use these plants. Uh, now, in addition to that, you also have uh, quite a diversity in petal shapes uh, from strap-like or star-shaped flowers. I really like the spider-like uh, shaped petals, really long sort of thin uh, petals, uh, round shaped. And then you also have diversity in flower color uh, where you may have varieties that are a good solid color or flecked or bordered uh, with other colors. So a lot of diversity there as well, as well as just diversity in flower color, uh, all the way from whites to reds and, and yellows and oranges and deep purples. So uh, just a lot of options in the landscape. Uh, one thing I think it's really important to keep in mind when we consider azalea varieties um, is that they bloom at different times. So we have early flowering types that are gonna be blooming, uh, really starting out here in the very near future uh, and going through to March. Uh, then we have those that are gonna be blooming in May and April. Uh, and then we have some late bloomers that will start up in June and can continue all, all the way into uh, the fall of the year. Uh, so, one thing you may want to consider when you're you know, choosing azaleas for your home landscape is to get varieties that are going to bloom at different times so that you can keep that color progressing throughout the year, uh, really showing off in the home landscape. So I'm gonna take some time, I'm gonna talk about some of the different varieties or species of azaleas, uh, starting with the natives, and I wanna just take a second to say that there, there's a, a lot of diversity out there uh, and there's no way that I can spend the time to, to go through every single one of them. So I've just picked out a few uh, kind of as an example, uh, but I would encourage you to, to look more into all the different variety that's out there uh, because I'm not able to mention every single one. Uh, but starting with the native azaleas, I'm going to start with this one. This is the native, uh, the, the Piedmont azalea, uh, rhododendron, all in the genus rhododendron again, uh, rhododendron canescens, uh, really nice white to pinkish, uh, tube, uh, tube-like flowers. Uh, there's really long stamens coming out, so you can kind of see an image of that right there, uh, what I was talking about earlier. Uh, these go up to a height of about 15 feet. Uh, and they have a really pleasant honeysuckle-like fragrance uh, to them. Uh, so really a gorgeous plant for the landscape, uh, really well adapted to a lot of our environments here in the southeastern United States. Uh, if we want a smaller plant, uh, this is the coastal or the dwarf azalea. Uh, common names uh, can, uh, can vary depending on who you're talking to. Uh, R. atlanticum is the species name here. Uh, again, white flowers, uh, some with a little bit of a pink flush to them. Uh, and this is a much more uh, compact plant, about three to five feet tall. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I think is really attractive about this is, is the aroma of the flowers is very rose-like. Uh, so they have a, just a really present, uh, pleasant aroma that they add into the landscape. Uh, getting into a couple of my real favorites, this is the Florida azalea or uh, rhododendron astrinum. Uh, really just brilliant yellow and orange flowers. They have that nice reddish tube that I think gives them a, a good contrast. Uh, and I really like the, the lemony fragrance that goes along with that. They're also quite a tall growing species, uh, so they can be quite large in the landscape and really just show off a fantastic amount of color. Another uh, real favorite, uh, you can see I like the oranges, uh, is the Acone azalea, uh, rhododendron flammium. Uh, really nice yellow and yellow, orange, red flowers. Uh, a lot of them will have a yellow blotch on that top petal. Uh, really a good you know, six to eight feet uh, tall and wide, uh, good upright growth uh, and a kind of a medium sized, it really works well in, that, in the landscape. I just really like the, the, the sort of flame-like color that these have. 
this is the plum leaf azalea or R. prunifolia uh, flowers. Uh, kind of have an apricot or orange color. Uh, often petals have a kind of a deep red blotch on them. Uh, and while they're usually going to be, you know, around five to eight feet tall, uh, they can get quite large. They'll reach a height of up to 20 feet. Uh, so certainly they can, uh, they can take up a lot of space and put on a lot of show. Uh, so I also want to talk about some of our, our non-native or our hybrid azaleas. Again, you know, there are many more species of natives, and there are certainly a lot more species of hybrids uh, that I'm going to be able to talk about. So I just picked out a few uh, to discuss. Uh, let's start off with the Kurumi hybrids. Uh, they get their name from where they originate in Japan. Um, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, tend to be a low, uh, you know, two to three feet tall. They can get a little bit bigger, uh, but they put on an awful lot of just really kind of smaller flowers, uh, really nice pinks. Uh, there are some bicolored varieties uh, within, uh, within this group. Uh, one of the really you know, big groups with a lot of varieties in it are the Southern Indica, occasionally also called the Southern Indian hybrids. Uh, really good fast growing, so they, they get bigger in the landscape really quick. Uh, I'm going to call them a you know, large azalea. They get up to about eight feet tall, uh, can spread out fairly wide. They bloom just a little bit later. Uh, I have uh, quite a few of these in my home landscape where they uh, absolutely do fantastic. Um, and these are the, the back, aper, back acre hybrids. Uh, and I mention these uh, specifically because I live in past Christian, Mississippi, uh, and these varieties were developed in past Christian, Mississippi. Uh, so uh, the gentleman who was uh, responsible for a lot of the development of, uh, uh, of azalea varieties in Maryland, uh, retired. his name was B.Y. Morrison. Um, he retired to past Christian, Mississippi, uh, and continued to uh, develop varieties um, and uh, developed about 50 varieties at his uh, place right off of Menge Road in Pass Christian. Uh, there are a lot of uh, variety here. A lot of them have frilled or double flowers. Uh, and if you're not familiar with them and you'd like to see them, uh, Pineville Presbyterian Church on, uh, on Menge Road uh, has a memorial garden there behind the church. Uh, be respectful, of course, um, uh, but they have a, a good number of those varieties uh, planted there uh, as a memorial to uh, Mr. Morrison, or Dr. Morrison, I'm not sure, uh, who was uh, also amongst his other talents, a uh, um, uh, played the uh, piano and the, or the organ at that, uh, at that Presbyterian church. Uh, a very, very common and absolutely extraordinary uh, group of varieties that you will see uh, very commonly at, at nurseries are the Encore Azaleas. Uh, and they are certainly popular for good reason because they, they get that name Encore, they bloom twice. Um, in both spring and fall. These were developed by uh, Buddy Lee in Independence, Louisiana, uh, and uh, are absolutely gorgeous uh, azaleas, uh, generally in the three to five foot high range. Uh, and you'll notice all of the varieties start with the, the word autumn um, uh, because of that fall, uh, uh, fall flower that they put on. Uh, so a really good, uh, a really good set of varieties that are very popular uh, and you're almost certain to run into as you go to the garden center or big box store where you purchase your plants. Uh, so again, many different varieties and, and a lot of a lot of plants out there. Uh, I could just take time to speak for speak to a few of them. Uh, so get out there and really investigate all of the variety that's available and see what you'd like to use in your landscape. Uh, when you are choosing plants for your landscape, you know, some things that you might want to consider is grouping them according to their height, you know, putting some taller plants in the background, putting some shorter point, uh, plants in the foreground uh, gives you those multiple heights to work with. Uh, and you can see the different plants as they come into flower. Uh, you do want to make sure if the flower colors are going to overlap, uh, oftentimes in, in horticulture, we'll, we'll use that color wheel. 
to make sure that we're using flower colors that are going to really work together uh, and look attractive. So it's a good idea, know what time they're going to flower and know what colors you're going to be mixing together to make sure that that's going to be a mixture uh, of colors that, that works for you and your landscape. Uh, and, you know, Azalea's put on a fantastic show. They do an even better job when you have a group of them together. So if you plant several of the same cultivar uh, right in the same area, you're really just going to get a, a massive pop of color in the landscape. Uh, so when to plant azaleas now, uh, technically we can put a container plant in the ground just about any time, uh, so long as we do that properly. Uh, but generally I am gonna recommend fall planting for azaleas. Uh, that's just gonna be a lot less stressful for the plant. Uh, the cool weather uh, is, you know, as the plant, you know, the plants are going dormant. Uh, so there's not as much demand for water and for nutrients. Uh, and it's going to be able to allow those roots to continue to grow throughout the cooler season. Uh, so you know, when it gets into the next year, uh, it is it's going to take off and, uh, and grow really actively. Uh, now, again, we can put container plants in the ground, particularly as we're getting into spring. Uh, certainly still time to do that. Uh, but ideally, you know, we do want to aim in that. Uh, you know, late October, kind of early November range for here in South Mississippi, maybe a little sooner if we're, uh, if we're talking about the northern areas of the state. Uh, now, azaleas, when we plant them in the landscape, we want to make sure we're planting them in a space they're going to be happy. Uh, they do prefer moist, well-drained soils. Uh, soils are going to be high in organic matter. Uh, and like a lot of our plants in the landscape, they don't like wet feet. Uh, so we do want to avoid any areas that you know water is going to accumulate. Uh, if you have problems with drainage or if you have water accumulating an area, uh, there's absolutely uh, no reason not to go with something like a raised bed or a berm. It's going to raise that soil level up a little bit, give you some uh, better drainage, uh, and the plants will uh, do a lot better. Uh, do keep in mind, even though we are talking about avoiding wet feet, azaleas can be fairly sensitive to drought. Uh, they tend to be fairly shallow rooted. Uh, and uh, so we want to make sure, you know, if we're going through a dry stretch uh, in the, particularly as we're into the summer heat in the year, uh, you may need to add a little bit of supplemental water uh, in order to take care of them. Uh, one thing that does make uh, azaleas kind of stand out in terms of taking care of them is they tend to prefer a fairly acidic pH. Uh, most of our plants in the landscape, we tend to talk about them preferring that, you know, around a 6.5. Uh, azaleas prefer a, a good bit more acidic pH range from about 4.5 to 6. Uh, so that's something you definitely want to consider when you're looking at doing your soil test uh, and making sure you're getting your fertilization right. Um, Azaleas do very well in filtered shade. Uh, and you know, ideally, if you have an area where you're going to get morning sun and some shade in the afternoon to protect them from some of that afternoon heat, uh, that's going to do really well for them. Uh, it is always a good idea to apply a mulch underneath your azaleas. That's going to conserve water in the soil, protect those shallow roots. It'll also provide some protection against extreme temperatures um, both extreme cold, like we've had for about the past week, uh, as well as those extreme temperatures that we tend to get into in July and August. It's also going to do a, a do you favors of taking care of a lot of those weed problems. Uh, and you, ideally, you want to replace that mulch on an annual basis, uh, three to five inch layer on the soil surface, and, and materials like pine straw, uh, pine bark, or, or fallen leaves in the fall. Uh, do fantastic as mulches for azaleas. Uh, as I already mentioned, azaleas do tend to be fairly shallow rooted. Uh, and when they get water stressed, they, they tend to have leaves that will kind of turn gray or wilt. Uh, you may see some scorch along the margins of the plant. Um, and so it's a good idea to apply irrigation. Um, and uh, of course, I, I'm going to advocate for drip irrigation as being the most efficient way to do that, uh, because that's going to deliver that water right down to the base of the plant, uh, where the where the roots need it, uh, rather than uh, spraying it across the, the leaves, where that can make some problems with disease a little bit worse, or uh, 
Uh, of course, some of that water is just going to evaporate away. Um, fertilization is not generally, uh, you know, really a, a big issue for azaleas. Oftentimes, you can get away just with the mulch that you're adding. Uh, and you do want to avoid over fertilization because that can lead to foliar burn. Uh, and if in really extreme cases, if you really uh, apply way too much, that can actually kill our plants. Uh, if you're going to fertilize, generally we're going to do that right after we uh, right after we have those plants flowering. Uh, and sometimes if we have a spring uh, flowering cultivar, uh, we'll apply a little bit more fertilizer, you know, around June. Uh, at a lesser rate than what we're getting in the spring. Uh, we don't want to fertilize after the end of June. So June 1st is our cutoff because uh, we don't want to interfere with bud set. We don't want to interfere with the winter hardiness of the plant. Uh, so we want to cut off that fertilizer there. Uh, generally, we're going to try to broadcast fertilizer. You can do that right on top of the mulch. A uh, good four to six inches from the trunk uh, to uh, beyond the edge of the canopy out to the drip line. Uh, what I do want you to make sure you avoid, you don't want to get any of that fertilizer onto the leaves of the plant because that can cause some issues. Um, pruning azalea is fairly straightforward. Uh, you know, I like plant that tells us when to uh, uh, when to prune it. And so we tend to, we want to prune our azaleas after, the, after they've bloomed. So that's going to be usually in late spring, but again, that's going to depend on the azalea you have. So when we prune them, you, know, you can remove any tall or lanky growth. If you have suckers coming up from the ground uh, that just kind of mess up the shape of the plant, you can remove those. And azaleas, like some of our other deciduous uh, evergreen plants, um, can be uh, rejuvenation pruned. So we can cut a healthy azalea down to six to 12 inches above ground level and it will come back and, and uh, uh, be like it's young again and, uh, and do a great job in the landscape. Uh, they do form their blossom buds for the next year during the summer. Uh, so again, we don't want to prune them late because we wanna make sure we have that wood there for next year. That's where we're gonna get our flowers. Uh, one thing that can be interesting is azaleas can be pruned or, or trained to grow just as a single uh, trunk uh, tree, uh, tree-like form. Uh, those look really interesting in the landscape. Uh, I've also seen some examples of bonsai trained azaleas uh, that are really attractive as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about propagating azaleas. I do want to begin with just a note about propagating plants. Uh, it's something that's been raised in some of the other presentations I've given. When you're propagating plants, uh, you do want to make sure that you're following the law and paying attention to whether that plant is patented. Uh, so, you know, breeders do a lot of work, spend a, a lot of time, effort, and money uh, to produce these fantastic varieties of plants. Uh, and so they do have those plants patented so that they're the ones who can propagate that uh, and get the return on all of that effort. Uh, so I encourage you, you know, if you have a plant that's not patented, uh, then enjoy and propagate it as much as you like. Uh, if you do have a patented plant, uh, please don't. Uh, you want to follow the law and, uh, and respect that patent and respect the breeder who put that effort in. Uh, you know, go down to the, the local uh, plant center, a uh, garden center or store, and, and buy yourself a few of them. That's, that's the way to propagate those. Uh, you will be able to note a patent on the plant. A lot of times that's going to be on the label. Uh, so it'll tell you uh, that, that, that there is a patent for that plant. That all being said, uh, azaleas generally are propagated by cuttings, at least for the evergreen azaleas. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, what you want to do is you want to take a two to three inch long terminal cutting anytime from June into September. Uh, after the new growth on that plant has hardened off. Uh, so you want to cut just below a node and remove the lower leaves. You can see a little diagram there. Uh, pinch off the terminal bud. That's going to be the bud at the very tip. Uh, and just leave two or three leaves on the stem. Uh, dip that cutting into some rooting hormone uh, and insert it into a growing mix. Uh, you can use all sorts of different materials for that. Uh, you can use potting soil. 
Uh, you can use perlite as the medium for that. Make sure it stays uh, really good and, and moist. You wanna keep that in a humid environment. So we're trying to limit water loss from that cutting. Um, and most cultivars are gonna wind up forming roots in about four to six weeks. Uh, and once they've developed a really good set of roots, we can transfer those into a larger container and then transplant those out in the landscape after a year. Uh, so the whole process start to finish, you're, you're looking about a year there, and it's probably going to be two to three years before you see that flowering out in the landscape. Uh, azaleas can also be propagated from seed. Uh, those seeds are, are formed on those terminal pods after flowering, uh, and you want to harvest those in October. You take out the seeds, uh, you just uh, tap them out onto a, a piece of paper or something like that to collect them. Uh, and just sprinkle them on to, uh, again, uh, something like sphagnum moss or peat moss um, and cover in a, uh, in a seedling flat. And ideally they do need to receive a good continuous light uh, and you'll start to see seedlings coming up from that. Uh, again, it's gonna take about three years from that to develop a, a good blooming plant, uh, but it's a really interesting thing to do and you can have a lot of fun with it. Uh, another way that we can propagate uh, azaleas is by layering. Um, and there are two forms of layering that are used for this. The first of this is what I've referred to as simple layering in some instances uh, or air layering. For stem layering, uh, just take a good uh, vigorous branch. Uh, it's long enough to bend and touch the ground. Um, and you wanna put that down on the ground uh, and basically you're gonna wound the bottom of that uh, you often will apply a little bit of rooting hormone to where that cut is uh, and basically bury that underneath the ground of about three to four inches of soil. Make sure you keep that area moist. You can see the tip of that branch comes back out uh, from where we buried it. Uh, that wound area will start to develop roots. Uh, and once it's effectively uh, developed roots, we can cut it away from the parent plant uh, and we have our, our propagated plant. Uh, air layering uh, is uh, just what it sounds like. It's done up above the ground. Uh, you wanna do this on late spring, uh, in late spring on wood from the previous year. Uh, get a good vigorous branch, uh, remove the leaves along that area of the branch and you make a shallow cut about one and a half to two inches long uh, at an angle on the underside of the stem apply rooting hormone there uh, and put about a cup of sphagnum moss around that uh, and tie it in place. And then you're gonna cover it with plastic uh, and cover that plastic with aluminum foil just to, to make sure that it, it reflects heat a little bit. Uh, and usually you'll see roots develop after somewhere between six months and a year. Uh, after it's developed good roots, again, you can cut it away from the plant uh, and you have your new plant. I would encourage you, if you're really interested in uh, plant propagation, uh, there are two videos up on the YouTube channel that you can go and, and watch through where I go into a little bit more detail with this and the, the directions there are gonna be a little bit more thorough. Um, so you can reference that if, you're, uh, if you have questions. I do wanna spend some time talking about some issues we can face with our azaleas. Uh, first of these is, you know, why might my plant have some, some leaves that are turn, turning yellow? Uh, often with azaleas, this is caused by an iron deficiency. Uh, and that may be because the soil pH is a little bit high, uh, or we have a little bit too much phosphorus in our soil. Uh, it's also a problem that we can have because we have uh, far more often than anything, uh, we have a little bit of uh, excess water in the area. Uh, and that's causing the roots problems, giving them a little bit of stress. Uh, if we do have iron chlorosis or you know, a, an iron deficit for the plant, uh, you can apply a ferrous sulfate as a fertilizer, uh, about an ounce of that to 10 square feet. Uh, if you have water stress, you know, obviously we wanna address those water issues. Uh, and you can, you know, if we've, if we've kind of crossed off those possibilities, uh, we do want, you know, possibly want to look at whether there might be a nematode problem that could affect the plants. Uh, and you can do that. We have a, a nematode diagnostic lab uh, for the extension service 
Uh, so you can bring a soil sample in, we can send that up to the plant diagnostic lab uh, and they'll do a nematode count and see if that might be the issue that you have. Uh, leaf scorch uh, is going to be the, the edges and the tips of the leaves uh, starting to die back and browning, uh, particularly around the edges of the leaves. Uh, this is a, a very common symptom of drought stress. Uh, so if it's been very dry and there's been no supplemental water for the plant, uh, you can start to see that, that, uh, that water stress happening. Uh, it can also occasionally happen if we broadcast applied a fertil uh, fertilizer, uh, gotten some of that fertilizer on the plant, particularly when the plant is wet, that could cause some issues there also. Of course, the, the way to address that if it's a water problem is, is of course to add water. Uh, and uh, if it's fertilizer issue, generally the plant will grow out of that problem uh, over time. Uh, we just don't wanna repeat the injury. Uh, something we have seen fairly recently is cold injury. Um, you will see the, the foliage turning brown. Uh, you may see uh, the buds. Uh, if they were starting to open up, they may, uh, they may abort and not form flowers. Uh, we may uh, see leaf drop, and in extreme cases, the bark can actually split uh, in response to cold. Uh, so, of course, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're purchasing varieties uh, that are going to be for the area that we're growing uh, or that we're, uh, that we're in. Uh, and we want to pay attention to your USDA hardiness zone. It's going to tell you what the, the cold uh, for this area is going to be. You know, here in Hancock County, uh, we're in, you know, 8B, 9A. Uh, but pay attention to your USDA hardiness zone to make sure that you're picking plants that are going to be appropriate for you. Uh, mulching and watering prior, prior to a freeze can be beneficial. And we're really protecting the root system of the plant from those extremes of temperature. Uh, if you have a plant that may be a little sensitive to cold, uh, putting it in an area where it's going to be protected from a uh, you know, cold northern wind uh, will also be beneficial. And if you know you have a plant that is going to be uh, potentially damaged, uh, covering it when, you, uh, uh, when you're when you going to have a cold event uh, using a plastic or burlap cover is, uh, is going to be really beneficial. Uh, one of the insects we very commonly see on azaleas is the azalea lace bug. Uh, you can see a picture of one right up there in the, uh, in the top picture. Uh, but what we normally see when we have this bug is what you see down there in the bottom picture. You see that stippling effect uh, on the tops of the leaves. Uh, and that's where the, the, the insect is, is put in its mouth part. It's kind of like a needle, sucks out the sap of the plant. Uh, the other thing we might see if we turn the leaf over is all these little black drops on the uh, bottom of the plant. Um, that's the, the excrement or what we call frass uh, for the insect. Uh, the insects themselves are, are quite small, usually somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. Uh, and you want to check these out early in the spring. If you start to see them, uh, controlling them um, early in the season will really uh, uh, solve a lot of problems without having to apply something later in the year when the population size. Uh, another one that we commonly see, this is the azalea caterpillar. Uh, adult moths are about an inch long. I don't often actually see the moths, moths uh, but uh, they tend only have one generation a year. So uh, they're uh, generally, they're gonna show up, you'll see the caterpillars and they'll, they'll be gone. Uh, over winter in the soil, come out, the uh, moth lays eggs. Uh, and you can see a, a significant number of these caterpillars grouped on azalea plants, particularly when, the, when they're small, they tend to spread out as the insects get uh, a little older uh, and a little bit bigger. Um, if, you, uh, if you go and go near them while they're on the plant, they will rear their head and their tail up at you. Uh, try to look aggressive. Don't be too concerned. They're, they're harmless. Uh, other than, uh, than just being a defoliating pest of your plants. Uh, if you can catch these uh, insects when they're small, you can control them with uh, what we'll call BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, and uh, you wanna do that before they get an inch or three quarters of an inch long. Um, they can be controlled with, with other pesticides when they're older. 
Uh, but generally speaking, I think once they've gotten uh, past a certain point, you just kind of let them go and, and they'll, uh, they'll be gone for the year. Uh, bark scale can show up. Uh, there are a couple of generations per year. Uh, what we normally notice first is that there is this black substance on the leaves that will just rub off when we uh, rub the leaf. Uh, that is uh, called the sooty mold. It's uh, the scale insects give off a, uh, a sugary substance. Uh, and there's a fungus that really enjoys that, lives on it. It's not really damaging the plant, but it does damage the plant's appearance. Uh, applying a dormant oil uh, in the late winter is a great way to help manage these. Or just using insecticidal soaps and dormant oils to control the immature scale uh, will help solve this problem over time. The sooty mold itself will just wear off. Uh, or if you just have a small plant affected, you can wipe it off. Uh, but normally it'll just wear off over time. Uh, do occasionally see leaf miners on azalea. It's actually a, a moth um, or the caterpillar of a moth. Uh, the young larvae tunnel inside the leaf. Uh, and then the olders will, uh, older larvae or older caterpillars come out uh, and roll that leaf over. Uh, and uh, occasionally you'll see large populations that will cause the leaf to turn brown. But very rarely is this a, a significant problem in the landscape. Uh, one thing I do fairly frequently see is a, a disease called leaf gall or exobasidium leaf gall. Uh, particularly see this in the spring uh, when we have a wet weather, really humid weather. Uh, and you see, you kind of see just what uh, just what it looks like in that picture. Uh, that leaf uh, and the leaf bud kind of swells up and becomes that gall. And they start off green and then at, over time they turn white. Uh, and those are the spores that can then be spread by water or by wind. Easiest way to deal with this is just to remove these when they're small uh, and before they turn white. Uh, that'll interrupt the life cycle of the disease and prevent it from spreading further in the landscape. Uh, and just pruning that away is a perfectly effective way to deal with the problem. Uh, petal, pl uh, petal blight, another fungal disease, uh, starts off as some little uh, um, pale or white spots on, the, on colored flowers or kind of reddish spots on white flowers. Uh, those will enlarge into kind of a tannish blotch. Uh, and the blighted flowers will fall on the ground. They can sometimes re uh, remain on the plant. Uh, so you just want to pick up any of that flower debris uh, from beneath the plants. Uh, sanitation is one of the most important things we can do for the overall health of the plant. Uh, if you have this problem, make sure you're applying new mulch because we want that to serve as kind of a barrier uh, between the soil where the, we may have that harboring the, the fungus uh, and the plant. Uh, web blight, uh, rhizoctonia web blight, uh, another fungal disease, we tend to see this as we get into the summer, uh, and the, the fungus tends to start off in the interior of the plant, a little bit more water there, uh, and the infected leaves will get some brown lesions on them, uh, and eventually it'll, it'll turn uh, brown, but oftentimes they kind of stay matted together by the growth of the fungus, uh, and then they drop to the soil in the fall. Uh, so. If you have you know, excessively wet foliage or really high humidity that does favor this problem, using drip irrigation uh, will definitely help uh, in making sure you remove that fallen debris from beneath plants in the fall. Uh, root rot can be a, a serious issue uh, caused by uh, Phytophthora, yet another fungus. Uh, it tends to be a problem we see in soils that are overly wet or just poorly drained. Uh, it can cause the entire plant to yellow. Uh, and oftentimes, if you see the plant, you look down at the root system. Uh, and the, the root system, rather than being a nice kind of healthy color, uh, has a, a dark color to it. it. looks like it's dying back. Uh, the wood uh, beneath the bark at the, dark, at the soil line can have a, a reddish discoloration to it. Uh, and really, what we need to do here, if we've got an advanced problem here, we need to remove that plant. Uh, and, uh, and correct for that excessive soil moisture uh, to, uh, to, keep the plant, to keep other plants in the area healthy. Uh, tig, uh, twig blight, uh, more fungi. 
uh, tends to affect larger branches uh, and that wilt will happen just on one branch. It'll eventually uh, potentially spread. Uh, you will see some discoloration, that reddish color underneath the bark. Uh, and oftentimes this happens where the plant's been wounded. So if there's environmental stress or a freeze, something like that, that can uh, make this problem a little bit worse. Uh, so pruning that damaged tissue away uh, is again gonna be the, the best solution there. Uh, so I appreciate you uh, being here and paying attention to this presentation. Uh, if, again, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer those for the people who are here. Uh, and if, uh, uh, if you're again listening uh, uh, on YouTube, I'd, I'd encourage you, if you have any questions, go ahead and put that down in the, uh, the comment area uh, and I'll be happy to come back and answer that question for you. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll have some presentations next week to uh, get that notice out as soon as we possibly can.